Hello, hello. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, a very warm welcome to, to all of you to our um, to our event today about the role of Islamic finance in the global global climate finance landscape. Um, this event is initiated by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and um, I'm from the UNEP DTU partnership, who is and will be moderating today. And let me also introduce you to our two distinguished speakers. So we have um, Burak Sagil, <laughs> who. Um, who is with the Turkish Industrial Development Bank, and they really have a, um, a fascinating showcase project how Islamic finance can enable renewable energies and energy efficiency. And yeah, they, it's in, in his case, it's, it's more called renewable energy and energy efficiency, and it doesn't even say a big label climate change all over the place. And we'll see how, how that... <laughs> yeah. Um, how that happens. And um, our second distinguished speaker, Abdulatif Abdul Bello, um, from the Economic Division of the Islamic Development Bank. So hosting us here, thank you very much for this, this wonderful room. Um, and he will also show us a bit more of the big picture of Green, green Suku. And um, yeah, we'll see in your presentation. So. Um, and I, I will begin just showing you where this comes from, why we are having this conversation and how it was initiated. So my, my own presentation will really be a, a shorter one coming from the, the climate finance space. So I personally, um, I personally know comparatively little about Islamic finance. And the whole idea of having this event came up in a conversation with a, with a good friend who is an Islamic finance expert. And I'm, I myself really come from the Green Climate Fund, World Bank type of climate finance initiatives. So, well, and one thing I realized is that when I look into the reports that I typically read, so what the World Bank published on climate finance, what the OECD published, what the Climate Policy Initiative published, even if I just, you know, I search in my computer for the word Islamic in the report and the word just is not there. But, and, but then on the other hand, there's this gigantic field of Islamic finance, and it's one of the fastest growing fields in finance globally. But if I go into Islamic finance reports, there's a lot of talk about green and renewable energy and energy efficiency, but the word climate change, in some of them I couldn't find it. So, um, and I think we really need to have that conversation, just given how, well, on the one hand, how my how much financial resources there are in the Islamic space, but then also how many people and how many countries would actually prefer to have Islamic finance compared to, to the more, more Western World Bank type of finance. Yeah, so um, this, this is really where, where I'm coming, coming from and, and my interest in the field is in so my, my job is basically to help developing countries access finance and structure their financial deals in a way that they, they can use, use Western donor finance and leverage that, leverage more national finance and, and really fulfill their INDC pledges. And often that is, that is difficult and we need domestic sources, we need private sector sources, we need all kinds of sources of finance that we can get because, well, as you all are aware, I, I, I believe there is a huge gap between where we want to be and where we are at the moment in terms of climate finance and in terms of the growth in renewable energies. So Islamic finance with the growth rate of 10% per, per year or even more than 10% per year in the last couple of years is a really interesting candidate. And then, um, and I, I believe most people in this room know much more about the details on, on those <laughs> rules than I do, but you have, if I understand correctly, the Islamic um, structures and rules of the game are that conservation of nature is actually a really important goal. So that's already built into this, the system to some way. So that that's made, makes it also a natural candidate for climate finance. Um, yeah, and I, I just wanted also to show you some numbers of where I'm coming from. So we, we are trying to help countries access finance for their mitigation actions. And 
there's really a huge gap between the donors and the recipients at the moment. So we see a lot of countries and also implementers in countries who express, yes, we, we have all these great ideas and great projects, but we can't find money for them. But then if you look at the donors, the donors have an issue finding enough projects that they want to finance and finding projects that fulfill their criteria. So um, this, uh, yeah, the, the upper graphic is from the UNFCCC NAMA registry. So if you put in a, a nationally appropriate mitigation action in that registry, you can also add, okay, we request financial support for this. And less than 3% of all the financial resources requested in the registry have actually been given. So there's a lot of ideas that don't receive finance. Also on the, the lower one is the Green Climate Fund, which is the, well, it's currently not yet the biggest, but it's going to be one of the most important channels for climate finance. And they are also struggling to get their money out of the door. So in the first year, um, they had a total of more than $900 million that they wanted to allocate to projects. But in the end, they could only fund about $170 million worth of projects, simply because they didn't have the, the proposals on their desks that they needed to see. Well, and one big issue that the donors want to see and need to see in their proposals is that they leverage co-financing. So the donor only gives a part of the money, and then there's other sources that come together to bring, to bring about a really large and transformational project. Yeah, and this, this is one, of, one slide that, that we see a lot when we talk about climate finances from the Climate Policy Initiative. Um, and it's, I, I'm well aware that it's in small writing, so you can't really read it. Um, but what's, what's really struck, make, making me wonder here is when I look at the at this part here, and that's the financial instruments. And when you, when you look at the details there, almost everything is financed by debt. And there's a little bit of equity and a little bit of risk-sharing instruments, but it's really, really small compared to the debt part. And yeah, so there, um, at least in this report, reporting on climate finance, the Islamic world shrinks to a tiny little line. And I, I do believe, for example, the project by the Turkish Development Bank never entered that report because it didn't have climate change printed all, all over it in big letters. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh yeah, and that's to to round this up with a story on the Green Climate Fund. I I work a lot with you know teaching in country, working with the national governments to to help them and support them to develop their proposals to the Green Climate Fund. And this was an experience in Jordan, where I explained that one of the requirements is see you you can't just apply for a grant, you have to use other instruments. And if you do renewable energies, yes, you can also finance them by loans, so you should consider that. And I got a very clear answer, no, we don't want any loans. Loans are, are not acceptable for Jordan anymore. Well, so um, I asked him if Islamic finance would be an option, and yes, it would be. So that really, um, that, that really started my interest in the sector, right? That I, I need to understand how Islamic finance works, how we can use the GCF to leverage Islamic finance to, to make these things happen. So, and this, this is from the Green Climate Fund homepage. And again, you have the distribution of, of the projects they approved so far in terms of financial instruments. The first row is grants and loans, and as you see, it's 41 and 46%, so it's almost everything is grants and loans. But what is interesting is this part down here. So, they do offer equity and they do offer guarantees as well. So these instruments, I, I believe, could be used to leverage Islamic finance on a, on a larger scale. And um, yeah, and that's, that's already coming to the end of my presentation. And Abdullah, who is with the Islamic Development Bank and our host, they are working on accreditation for the GCF. and. Yeah, we'll, we'll see where we can take it from here. And maybe guarantees can help you. Maybe you find other ways to finance it. But I, I really need, think we need this conversation. So thank you, Abdullah. Thank you. Abdullah. Uh, <clears throat> Bismillah rahim Salatu wasalam ala rasulul kareem. Uh, let me welcome you to this section. Uh, just try to clear some... Uh, 
issues. Uh, before coming to this uh, meeting in Marrakesh, we at Islamic Development Bank prepared seven different publications, and one of them is about the role of Islamic finance in financing climate change. So those, this seven documents will be launched officially on the 15th of November. We do have a series of uh, copies of the document outside if you want to pick one. So by the time we finish, I do hope the publication will be all over the world in Google, so that when you search Google, okay, when you Google, you'll be able to find this document there. Uh, so let me move quickly to my presentation. Uh, we are here today to discuss the role of uh, Islamic finance in climate change financing. Um, where does climate change fit in, in the whole equation? Uh, if you recall, last September in, uh, what do you call it, in New York in 2015, we had this SDG that was signed on by many head of state. It has 17 goals. And if you look through, it is divided into three major themes. You have supporting inclusive growth, enhancing access to basic services, and the third component is promoting environmental sustainability. There are five uh, goals put together under promoting environmental sustainability. And one of them has uh, a focus on climate change. It is the one in the middle. It's written here, we need to take action, urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. So many countries signed on to this SDG, and the goals have to be implemented. I'm happy to note that many countries also prepare their climate action plan. So within the action plan, cover uh, mitigation, adaptation, and the dual benefit. So I will not go to the detail, but just a background why we are discussing this issue. The climate change is part of international initiative, and that's why we are here today in Marrakesh to follow up on the climate Paris, the Paris climate uh, agreement reached in 2015 December. Before this, okay. Um, there's a new report that came out two weeks ago, new economy report. It came out with a rough estimate. Let me go back to this, uh, sorry. How do I move back? It's not moving. Eh? I want to move back. What do I do? Yeah, if you look at the source of this document, the title is uh, the source of this graph, New Climate Economy 2016 Report. It was released about two weeks ago. The report further stated that we need $90 trillion is needed in infrastructure globally over the next 15 years to combat climate change. It's a huge resource. It went further to say there must be investment priority on low carbon climate resilient development as well as energy efficient projects. But to do so, there must be differentiated infrastructure challenges between developed and developing countries. The requirement of developed countries in terms of infrastructure are different from those of developing countries. Most developed countries need to repair the existing infrastructure. But developing countries, they need to start from the scratch to build new roads, new dams, new uh, infrastructure to meet the modern requirement. Now, the question there is, where do we mobilize this $93 trillion? We need finance and investment from all sources, anywhere the money can come from, both from private, from Islamic finance, for other few. That's where we fit in. This is how Islamic finance come to complement the existing uh, modes of financing. Now, I mentioned to you that there is a report focused on 90 trillion, but there's another report before that which was prepared. You see, the period given here is 2010 to 2030. The one I mentioned to you was released two weeks ago, it was 90 trillion. This report is saying investment that is needed to green agriculture, telecommunication, all the major sectors of the economy. The figures are stated here. 
For agriculture, we need 125 billion. But per year, between 2010 and 2030, we need $5 trillion, I mean $5 trillion to green each of these economic sectors. If you look at the extreme hand here, you have additional investment required in a green growth scenario. Our focus now going forward is how to transition from our conventional growth to green growth. And when we say green growth, there are three th two things that come on board. Low carbon development and climate resilient development pathways. So we have these two together co form green growth model. So for green growth model, we need to build, we need building and industries that will cost us 331 billion. Within this, the breakdown is as follows, forestry 40 billion, energy 139, transport vehicles 189, 187 billion. So this is the, what you call the breakdown of another scenario. The first scenario you saw was 90 trillion. Another scenario, the first scenario was from 2016 to 2030. This is a new scenario from 2010 to 2030. So we have different sources giving us different uh, scenarios. Now, where does Islamic finance play an important role? It offers alternative and complementary approach to addressing infrastructure financing gap to fight climate, in, climate change. Islamic finance also appeals to broader communities, including non-Muslims, owing to its modus operandi. Islamic finance system is ethical. It ensures that financial transactions are linked to the real economy. It promotes financial stability and also long-term sustainability. These are the key features of uh, Islamic uh, finance. Uh, totally, the global outlook of Islamic financial services is about 2.1 trillion at the end of 2015, according to Global Islamic Financial Report 2016. Uh, in recent time, we have seen slow in the uh, growth of this Islamic finance. It used to be two digits. Now it's single digit in the last two years. In seven, I mean, uh, in 2014, it was 9.3% growth. In 2015, it was reduced by two percentage points, 7.3%. Now, this is an overview of where we stand as of 2015. The first row you see there is the potential of the Islamic financial industry. Uh, it has very strong potential of reaching seven uh, billion, trillion by the end of 2015. But actually, we were able to observe 2.1 trillion by the end of 2015. You can see the gap. The gap is about, the potential gap is about five trillion dollars. The growth, as I've mentioned to you, has been declining from 2011, when the growth was 19%. It falls down to 2012. I mean, it went a bit to 2012, and from there, it has been slowing. The latest figure we have is 7.3 growth in 2015. On the average, between 2009 and 2015, we have 15% per year. Now, the last row you see here is the catch-up. Based on 10 years growth in potentials, we need about 27%. Uh, growth. You can see we are now 15% per year from 2019, 2009 to 2015. We expect to have 27% to be able to catch up to meet the potential. Now, because we're talking about climate change, I'll focus on the instrument that is very important to climate change. And the main instrument is the Sukuk or Islamic bond. What is it? Sukuk are Sharia compliant security backed by a specific pool of assets. It can be used to fund green projects such as clean energy, mass transit, water conservation, forestry, and low carbon technologies. So all this put together, we can use green Sukuk. Well, I can, as you can see here, it's now increasing, increasingly being used to fund projects that can help countries adapt to and mitigate climate change while giving investors fixed income investment opportunities that have a positive impact. We also notice that green bonds are, growing invest are a growing investment opportunities and funding tools for sustainable infrastructure. In 2012, uh, a green Sukuk working group was established by the Climate Bond Initiative there were four institutions that came together 
to see how to support greens to cook. So there was a working group, global greens to cook working group, established by these four institutions. The mandate of this group is to ratify green energy projects that fall under Sharia compliant categories for potential investors. So to really So beside this uh, Green Sukuk Working Group, we have another, uh, what do you call it, standard, Climate Bond Standard Certificate that helps investors to identify eligible assets for Green Sukuk. So we have the Working Group, and then we have another, what do you call it, certification body called Climate Bond Standard Certification. So let me show you, in recent years, let me show you uh, the activities of this certification board, I mean, uh, climate bond initiatives. These are from February 2016 up to October 2016. These are all projects that were bonds that were certified by this initiative. And they are all from different parts of the world. You can see this row here from France, India, Australia, Netherlands. Mostly these are non member countries. You can see the growth of Islamic, uh, I mean, the Green Sukuk. Now, there has been a sharp increase in issuances of uh, green sukuk as more institutions try to tap on the green bond market. The green bond market has some 130 billion if, as of today. As of July 2016, the green bond market reached 130 billion of debt outstanding. And you can see from the graph, which represents 0.15 of the total global fixed income market as of a report that was released two weeks ago by BlackRock institution. Now look, this is the outlook of the 130 billion in terms of uh, rating. You can see the first column there, majority of them are AA, triple A rating, rated. Uh, others are AA, and then you can see the last column, some of them are not rated. So this is the global outlook, and most of them are government supported greens to cook. So conclusion, uh, sorry. I need to go back. OK. Um, you can see that there is a growing uh, interest in green sukuk, in uh, green bond, which means green sukuk will really go a long way to contribute to financing the $90 trillion of global infrastructure needed by 2030 to tackle climate change. That's a strong and great opportunity to explore green sukuk from Islamic finance dimension. To do that, we need also to review the legal framework in many countries to allow sukuk to operate. These are the two essential conclusions I want to draw from this presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Abdullah, for, for your great overview of the, the bigger picture in Islamic finance. And I would now like to ask Burak to, for his presentation, and he will give us an insight on, on an actual case where the uh, Turkish Industrial Development Bank used Islamic finance to, yeah, in a climate change context. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. And before uh, starting my presentation, I would like to thank IDB and also uh, UNEP DTU partnership for inviting us for this uh, panel. And uh, before uh, de delving into our IDB partnership cooperation, I would like to give some brief information about Industrial Development Bank of Turkey, STSKB, uh, I was going to mention. STSKB, and uh, we are a privately owned development bank, bank with public and private mission, and our main shareholder is Ishbank Group. 50% uh, of our shares belongs to Ishbank, and 9% of them belongs to Vakuf Bank, and the other rest is free float. We are working with uh, most of the DFIs around the world, including, as you might imagine, IDB 
And other DFIs that we are working with includes World Bank, EIB, EIB EBRD, IFC, Australian, Australian Development Bank, European Investment Fund, AFD, KFW, and JBIC. What do we do? Uh, we provide financing, sustainable financing. Uh, 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 we, we provide financing for the sustainable investment, investments in Turkey. And before uh, delving into IDB's cooperation, I would like to just mention you about the sustainable journey of Turkey. It all started in 1980s. On, it all started in 1980s on the environmental factor and credit evolution process. And in 2005, uh, it gains momentum with the environmental management system. And in the following years, it goes with ISO certificates and also GRI approved sustainability reports and, also, uh, and uh, global compact reports. In the last years, uh, we founded our sustainability committee and also published uh, our global compact report. And also uh, we were listed in Borsa Istanbul Sustainability Index. As uh, Abdul Latif Bey mentioned, uh, this year also we uh, issued a green bond and uh, we received a green deal of the year in the EMEA region. Uh, it was a, a 300 million US dollar bond with a five years tenor. And also we were shortlisted with Apple, Starbucks uh, on the innovative side of this uh, award. And what we do in renewable energy investments, uh, we are working in the renewable energy field in the last 12 years. And total financing committed to this sector is 3.1 billion US dollars. And the total investment cost is around 8.2 billion US dollars. And we provided financing for 167 renewable energy investments, 84 of it hydraulic power plants, 20 wind projects, 50 solar, seven geothermal, and uh, lastly, six biomass projects. And the total generation capacity of these projects is around 4,222 4, megawatts. And this corresponds to the 13% uh, of Turkey's uh, renewable, ener in renewable installed energy capacity. Uh, on the energy efficiency side, uh, we are working in the energy efficiency part in the last seven years, and we provided over uh, 493 million US dollars to the 73 projects of the 45 companies. And the total energy savings that is achieved from these investments is an equivalent of the annual heating consumption of uh, 350,000 households. And the, as you can see in here, uh, the sectors that we provided financing in the energy efficiency is uh, steel, cement, plastics, petrochemicals, and automotive sectors. Uh, when we come to the relationship with IDB, uh, it all started in 1980s with the intermediation of equity participation in private sector companies. We were intermediating IDB in that regard. And in 2010, uh, we started the search for an applicable financial model. Uh, and in 2000, in uh, 200, uh, 2012, uh, we reached an agreement of applicability of restricted mudaraba. And we signed the agreement on 4th of December 2012. And the themes of this agreement is renewable energy and energy efficiency. And after that, we signed as it also this uh, agreement, IDB restricted mudaraba 1, was. Uh, introduced in the annual meeting in Jakarta as a success story. And we signed the second restricted Mudaraba agreement on 2013. The first one was, uh, in terms of size, is 100 million US dollars. Second one is like 220 million US dollars. And today our work progressed in two channels. 
first one is identifying a plausible financial model and also finding companies that will benefit from these IDB's funds. Uh, what did we do with the IDB one? The, uh, the size of this facility is like 100 million US dollars. We financed two hydropower plants, wind, one wind power plant, one solar power plant, and six energy efficiency projects. And the impacts that we gained from these uh, investments are like total investment capacity of the plants is like 370 megawatts. And annual carbon reduction is like 1 million tons equivalent. And total fixed project cost of all of these projects is like 641 million US dollars. And the energy, annual energy savings is like uh, 270 gigawatt hours per annum. In the second uh, financing agreement that we signed with IDB, which is in terms of size 220 uh, million US dollars, we financed one hydropower, five wind power, and five energy efficiency investments. And the major impacts that we gained from these investments is like the total installed capacity is like uh, 489 megawatts. Annual carbon emission re reduction is like 1.7 million tons equivalent. And total project cost is like 1 billion US dollars. And the annual, annual energy savings is like uh, 1,338 gigawatt hours. And to sum up, I would like to uh, thanks to Turkish Treasury as well because he is the guarantor of this fa these facilities, and uh, without their contribution, it won't be happening. And also IDB about their uh, flexibility and the broader conceptualization of the facility, and it enables us to uh, get the broader vision of sustainability under, under a single financing facility, and. Uh, we believe that the cooperation of uh, IDB is the key issue to us address the sustainability matters, and we are looking forward to enhance this cooperation. Thank you very much for your listening, and this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Burak, for your presentation. And um, I'm, I'm glad to admit that these two guys just proved me completely wrong when it came to Islamic, Islamic and climate finance, because they are, they are doing it already. We just, in the official climate finance world, we don't have it as much on our radar as we should. So, um, and I have a few questions for them myself, but I actually would prefer to give the audience um, the floor first. So um, please, if, there's, if there are any questions or comments. And, Good afternoon, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, I'm Dr. Brian from Iraq. I just have one question. Uh, most of our Islamic countries, it's uh, developing countries, and uh, we're thinking about adaptation more than mitigation. So what's the Islamic finance do with this subject? Thank you. Um, so, in adaptation, I mean, one thing, there's, there's a, a big difference between mitigation and adaptation finance, obviously. And mitigation finance is, in a way, it has been around for a long time. We have decades of experiences in renewable energies. And in adaptation, we are just finding out what we, what we are doing in some way. So, um, and I, I can tell it to you from the, from the Green Climate Fund perspective and from the let's say UNFCCC type of cl climate finance, and their adaptation is very much driven by grants. 
so it's not not finance in the sense of a, a sukuk where there's some kind of return and also the scalability into the trillions we we don't really have that in adaptation yet um, there may be some sectors in agriculture where it's actually profitable investments that also are adaptation, but a lot is resilient infrastructure, like building a dam is never profitable. It, it's just protecting from a catastrophe. So, um, for example, the, there's a large um, infrastructure project in Bangladesh by KFW you now, but that is, is entirely grant financed for the infrastructure. So. Well, thank you for this question. Um, I will not see all our member countries are uh, purely into adaptation more than uh, mitigation. We know when we talk about mitigation, the cost implication is very high. Adaptation depending on uh, how exposed some countries are into certain sectors. So before we generalize, I think we need to look at the national climate plan of individual countries and then sum up to be able to see whether they are into more into adaptation and mitigation. I would not want to speculate because I'm not too sure we have any uh, concrete evidence to back this up. But I would rather say uh, it all depends on the interests of individual countries and the level of development because the cost involved in mitigation is so high. If you look at the figures uh, team presented, there was a schematic something there. Adaptation was just uh, 25 billion compared to 371 mitigation. So if you look at the breakdown of uh, these two figures, it varies from developed and developing countries. So if you look at the Islamic world you talk about, most of them are developing countries. So the fact that they are developing, the requirement will be huge compared to developed countries. So I agree with you, either adaptation or mitigation, most of our member countries or most of the Islamic world will be more, there will be more demand for support for both adaptation and mitigation. But it's worth studying this further to see the characterization of our member countries in terms of adaptation and mitigation. Thank you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. One is a comment, and and then I have a question. Uh, I think the comment is in relation to uh, the question from uh, our brother uh, Iraq. Um, the Islamic Development Bank, uh, where I work in the agriculture sector. Uh, we are investing in a lot of uh, integrated projects uh, through value chains that are, that are enhancing the adaptations of, uh, of, of farmers to climate change and climate variability. Uh, on the input side, improved seeds, fertilizers, integrated soil fertility management in, in uh, irrigation output side, we have market access interventions so when, when you add up our investments in agriculture, uh, that's a group. Uh, it's about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Bello, it's about 10 billion uh, already uh, in that space. So that, I think, needs to be part of the equation uh, in terms of accounting. Uh, uh, so there is, there is investment going on, and that should be increased uh, much more, and I think the bank is committed to growing that space uh, uh, over the years. Right now, we are doing about a one billion a year. Over the next ten uh, uh, years, we, the bank is likely to do a two billion investment by year in, in, in the agriculture sector. My question is to Dr. Bello. Uh, uh, you mentioned the, I may be wrong. The, the, there's a decline uh, over the years in in in, uh, in the. Uh, in, in growth in general in Islamic uh, financing. Um, uh, could you is, is mention what are the reasons uh, uh, for, for that decline, which is quite significant in, in this space of, uh, of financing?
look at the table. Hello? Yeah, if you look at the table I showed you, we have the potential growth of Islamic finance. We were expecting this to be around 7 trillion by the end of 2015. But for one reason or the other, we saw it around two points. So the gap is about five billion. Well, it is difficult to see specifically what are the reasons because there are many factors. We cannot say uh, this will continue. If you look at the major participants in terms of Islamic finance, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Malaysia, these are the three countries that are really doing well in terms of Islamic banking and financing. They are on top. These are the three top countries. In recent time, you notice that one of the countries was uh, undergoing I mean, a sanction, Iran. And then we saw also in some of these other countries, economic downtown, we saw slowdown in growth that will also affect the growth of Islamic finance. So you have to look at the, the whole economy of a country to be able to tell that there are some signals here that indicate that it's the, the slow growth in Islamic finance is as a result of the economic slowdown in some of these countries. Thank you. So, do, do we have more comments or questions? Please feel free to, to speak your mind. This is also, you know, this is also very, very open. You can just throw in ideas that even if they are not very elaborate. So. Well then, maybe I have to throw in one of my own ideas that are not that elaborate. Um, and it's, it's one thing to, it's just one possible way forward to bring together the Islamic finance world and, and what we normally call the, the, the regular climate finance. Um, and maybe one thing we could think about is to request the kind of readiness or the CTCN type of support to develop Islamic investment opportunities in, in a country like Iran, for example. Where, so, so one thing that the Green Climate Fund is offering and, and also the other financial institutions in, under the UNFCCC offer is this, this readiness or initial support. And maybe that can be used to, you know, to find, find a way where we can use a Green Climate Fund guarantee, for example, to help the Islamic Development Bank to, to make a big project like, like the Turkish one and make that happen in, in another less developed Islamic country as one potential way. So. Um. Well, I can see that uh, there is a growing convergence between Islamic uh, Green Sukuk and the conventional Green Sukuk. And this is taking place because we saw investors gradually moving towards socially responsible, I mean, socially responsible investment. If you look, there is a MCI, what do you call it, a record, I mean, a, a chart. I was looking at one recently. They had one on MCI regular and MCI low carbon. And you look at the returns, they are so close. Even uh, in certain areas, the MCI low carbon uh, index is performing better. So we are seeing general movement in terms of people who are conscious of the impact of uh, what you call it, the need for everybody to go for low carbon uh, economic development and so on and so forth. So investors are also worried about the impact of the COP, uh, rising, uh, I mean, uh, warming, the global warming and so on and so forth. So we are seeing a gradual pattern in investors moving to socially responsible investment. And when we talk about global social investment, it's just a, so close to Islamic finance because in Islamic finance, we ensure that anything prohibitive from Islamic uh, dimension, there's no investment going to that, like alcohol, ammunition, and so on, that are uh, inimical to the health or survivability of individual. So because of the growth in socially I mean, uh, investment, I mean, socially responsible investment, I'm very optimistic that there's likely be a convergence between Islamic Sukuk and Green Sukuk project going forward. And 
maybe, so we have about half an hour left, but I, I think there's no harm in closing early. So I, I would ask for a closing statement from you. And from my side, um, oh, oh no, we have one more comment. So we continue, thank you. Just one, one question for a colleague from the, the bank. Um, uh, I, I was curious to know why there are no investments in, in the area of agriculture. Uh, for example, insurance um, uh, uh, schemes, uh, Takaful or, or other insurance schemes that uh, uh, would be supported under Islamic uh, school. Uh, is there no interest in that in, uh, in Turkey, uh, companies that could offer um, insurance schemes uh, against uh, drought or floods or uh, diseases or uh, things that are a threat to production uh, of farms? Uh, why, why, no, why no investment in that area, uh, which is of interest uh, to us? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, the agreement that we signed with IDB is basically consists of energy efficiency investments and renewable energy investments. And in that regard, uh, there were no sectors in this perspective in the agriculture, so there were no investments in that part. That's because of the agreement that we signed with IDB. It's called restricted mudaraba and in the agreement there is no uh, special sector that we can finance. And Burak is also from the Industrial Development Bank. So, yeah. Um, did you? Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Looking at the audience, I think I'll come back to the closing statements anyway. Is that OK? Yeah. So um, I go last. Um, if we look at the climate change imperatives, there are certain key pillars that uh, would be of interest to IDB and uh, countries. One is the finance. We have been providing finance, and we will continue to provide finance to support our member countries we are needed. The second imperative is capacity building and knowledge. Countries, money is not enough. Countries also need the capacity. When technologies are developed, they need this te technology needs to be transferred. So we need to help countries in developing their skills in how to use these technologies and how to move forward. So the second imperative is capacity and knowledge sharing. The third element I see here is partnership. No country or development institution can do this alone. When innovation is developed somewhere, we need partnership to support the innovation, to share knowledge, and then co-finance some of these uh, smart technologies. They, are, they require huge resources. So I believe in the long run, Sukuk uh, bond, with Islamic green Sukuk, Will, will eventually have significant contribution to the 90 trillion dollars required to fill the financing gap to tackle climate change uh, going forward. Uh, so we call on the international community to look into Islamic finance as alternative and complementary system that could really support and then bridge the financing gap for tackling not only climate change, all international challenges that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting again for this wonderful <laughs> event. And I would like to say that our uh, cooperation for with IDB will will go on in the following years, and we can provide financing in the sustainable investments with the Islamic funds. And thank you very much. Oh, there's, there's one more question from Iraq. And then you are most welcome. Sorry to come back again. Just a suggestion. 
in, in our countries, I mean Islamic countries, the building capacity is very important issue. So I suggest for IDB or your bank to um, maybe help some people from these countries to achieve MSc or PhD on climate change, on green uh, industries or something like that may help the countries, the people, climate, and the bank. It's, it's like small grants for students from Islamic countries to achieve and, and degrees in, in the climate change because climate change awareness should be very important. Thank you so much. That, that is actually a very nice, um, nice lead for me because I, I also want to thank again the Climate and Clean Air Coalition for initiating this event and in particular my absent colleague Yakbun Gurgos who, um, who has a degree in climate change and is working at the United Nations Environmental Programme with a deep understanding of Islamic finance. So, um, yeah, my big thanks to absent friends. <laughs> um, and maybe just as a closing word from my side, so um, having no relation to Islam in my, my own per personal life, I really, I don't have any religious motivation to look at Islamic finance. But I come there from a purely analytic, economical perspective, and I still think it's an amazing tool, and it's perfectly suitable for the challenges of climate change. So um, I really believe this dialogue and intense collaboration between the, the more Western-driven, more what we call traditional um, climate finance approach and ISDB and also, also the, the Islamic countries needs to happen urgently. So thank you very much again. And